and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from October 1988. I get my hands on a Sam Coupe. I play some games, have a chat with Jeff, and end the show at Birmingham. But first, it's the news. Rainbow Arts have hit problems with one of their new releases this month. The much heralded and previewed Spectrum game, Great Guyana Sisters, has run into a spot of trouble. It seems Nintendo have stepped in, and in the words of David Baxter, are getting heavy. They claim the game is too similar to Mario Brothers, and have asked Rainbow Arts, the company releasing the game, to halt production and pull any titles that have already been distributed. Also in trouble is the game Katakis, also due to be released by Rainbow Arts. This time it's Activision sending the legal threats, as they claim the game is too similar to R-Type. Both games may never see the light of day. Mediagenic have secured the rights to produce conversions of five Sega arcade games to the Spectrum. Splitting the work between Electric Dreams and Activision, both Mediagenic's labels, the titles will be Galaxy Force, Altered Beast, Sonic Boom, Hot Rod and Ace Attacker. They are expected to be released sometime in 1989. Being disappointed with the progress and programming of their own in-house James Bond game, DeMarc recently asked Elite if their upcoming game Aquablast, a speedboat game, could be used instead. Elite agreed and now the game will feature both companies on the inlay and no doubt Elite will have a nice fat paycheck at the end of it. And that was the news. And now on to the top 5 games. At number 5 is Bionic Commando by Go. At number 4, Darkseid by Incentive. At number 3, Outrun by US Gold. At number 2, Target Renegade by Imagine. And at number 1, Football Manager 2 by Addictive. And that was the news and top selling games from October 1988. Rumours began spreading around Christmas 1987 of a computer only known as a Super Clone. Not much was known about it, at least according to Crash Magazine, and it was all being done in secret. Even the company designing it had not yet come forward and revealed their name, although a few months later and all would be revealed. In March 1988, more announcements. A new Spectrum was going to be released, but the biggest surprise was that it would not be Sinclair or Amstrad releasing it and the name of the company was finally made public. Miles Gordon Technology, the company behind the Disciple and Plus D interfaces for the Spectrum, were said to be working on a Spectrum clone, with much more powerful hardware that could possibly rival the 16-bit machines. The name of this beast? The Sam Coupe. The details looked impressive. Higher resolution, more colours, more ports. Very nice. But the biggest question was would it run Spectrum software? The manufacturers claimed it would and Crash Magazine tested this on a prototype with good results. Time moved on and news was slowly trickling through. In April 1988, Yor Sinclair added to the rumour with an article in their news page. And finally, in February 1989, we got the fuller story thanks to Crash Magazine who interviewed the company and gave us photographs of this new computer. This was to be the next step up for Spectrum owners. The Plus 2 and Plus 3 gave us better keyboards and even a floppy disk, but we were now lagging behind the 16-bit machines and consoles. This new computer would improve screen resolution, give us better text modes, more colours, and remove colour clash in some instances. It would give us better sound and better input, and better expandability. It would give us a standard disk drive, and the very best thing, it had a Spectrum emulation option, so you could run a lot of your old existing games, or so it was said. This was then the next logical step up for Spectrum owners, but in reality, things didn't work out so well. Launched in 1989, the machine was well built and interesting to look at. It had a style all of its own. The keyboard was great, very responsive and nice to use. 
the expansions on the back seemed never ending, with MIDI ports, a joystick port, an expansion port, a cassette port, a light pen port, a SCART connector, and of course the power socket. The basic model had 256k of RAM, expandable internally to 512, or even up to 2.5 megabytes with external add-ons. How would we ever use that much? It had a built-in 3.5 inch disk drive capable of storing 800k of data, and an option to add a second drive to the unit itself. A viewer of the show kindly sent me his SAM to play around with, and so with eager anticipation I set it up. One of the demos that came with it introduced the machine to new users, and it had some pretty impressive stuff included. The display is capable of showing 128 colours, and offering no colour clash, a huge step up. The sound was also a step up, offering 6 channels over 8 octaves. The SAM had a disappointingly small number of commercial games released for it, and only a small number of those worth a mention. Here's Manic Miner, yes that old favourite got a SAM port. The graphics and music are better, as you would expect, and the gameplay is retained. This is Defenders of the Earth, again a lot of colours on screen. Nice effects, but bloody terrible to play. And this is Prince of Persia, a great conversion, matching the 16-bit machines. And Lemmings, yes, Lemmings was also written for it, and an excellent version it is too. There was also a near arcade perfect version of Defender, and this is excellent. The Sam had several disc magazines supporting it too, Mag1 for example, and the long lived Fred. These showcased the machine, and also included news, reviews, coding examples, demos and reports. But now onto the more important things, Spectrum emulation. To do this you have to load a program that copies the Spectrum ROMs into memory, changes a few addresses, and then drops you into a menu. And from here you should be able to load games. There are several different emulators available and I tried most of them, and I couldn't get a single game to load. I tried the old fashioned tape method, but nothing happened. I tried different games and different volumes and again nothing happened. Maybe it was just the SAM getting old. I then created a disk containing snapshot files, which some emulators claim to load. I load the emulator, insert the disk with the games on, and you can view them, type in the game name, and you go back to the emulator menu, and then you can drop back into the Spectrum. And at this point, either nothing happened, the Spectrum crashed, or you got dumped back into the menu. Very irritating. One emulator even let you load old plus D snapshots, so I set about creating a disc with those on, and that failed to load as well. To make sure it wasn't the SAM, I tried all of this in the emulator you can get for a PC, and it acted just like the real hardware, nothing would load. Very disappointing, especially after four days of trying. I then had a brainwave, I swapped out the mono tape lead, and put in a stereo one, and voila, the very first Spectrum game loaded. This was Invaders from Arctic Computing, and I could immediately tell it was running faster than the original. I located a few disk images that already contained games, and finally I could test out the emulation.
And yes, the games run faster than a real Spectrum, and this is evident in both sound and graphics. In most cases, the slight speed increase would not matter, but I can see it causing issues with fast-paced games where timing is important. At least it works though, and for anyone upgrading, you could load most of your old games. I say most because some games with custom loaders refuse to work. Miles Gordon Technology did release a device to improve emulation and loading called the Messenger, but I think by this time it was too late. After many hours of trial and error, the reason for the confusion was not to do with the software or functionality of the SAM, but rather something missing. Many of the emulators needed the game to be loaded via tape initially, and then to save them to disk, you had to get back to the emulator's main menu. To do this, you press the break button. However, I kept pressing the reset button because that's all I could see on the back. I then noticed a small hole, and a quick trundle through the manual identifies this as where the break button should be. Closer inspection shows that it has snapped off. Without this, it would be impossible to convert Spectrum games over to the SAM, which is where all the confusion came in. Even though I now understand the process, it still would be very time consuming, but back in those days, that was the only option. I'm not knocking this computer, far from it. The SAM is a great machine, and specification wise, the best 8 bit micro. It could almost compete with the likes of the Amiga and the Atari ST, with the bonus of being able to run Spectrum games. Had there been an easy option to transfer games, and a way to slow them down to normal speed, then this would have been the ultimate machine for Spectrum owners to move up to. It provided all your games with new hardware, a great keyboard, excellent graphics and sound, and the potential to run some excellent new titles using this impressive machine. Sadly, only a few games pushed it though, with the likes of Prince of Persia and Lemmings topping that list. Like any new machine, it will rise or fall based on the content produced for it, and the SAM seemed to have limited support in that area. I have only covered a small part of the SAM Coupe here, because I was interested mainly in the emulation aspect, and the move over for existing Spectrum owners. There are still games being written for this machine, so it's far from dead. An interesting part of Spectrum history then, and a nice item to finally get my hands on. This is Trader, produced by Pixel Productions and marketed by Quicksilver in 1983. When I first saw the adverts for this game way back, I always wanted it. I always wanted to see just how great it was, and I avoided playing it for years, in fact until a few months ago, when I finally got the real boxed game. Just look at that box. Reading the manual gives you some idea of the game, but not much. There's some nice touches in there too, like the trading certificate, and details about each of the aliens you're likely to meet. You are a trader, obviously, and the game follows a linear plot, almost on rails, with you interacting a few times. You start by buying items to fill your hold, and use all of your credits, or as many as you can. The aim is to make as much profit as possible when you reach the end of the game, which I've already said, because of the linear style, always happens after a set number of events. The first thing I noticed about the game were the graphics, and initially I was disappointed. They looked like direct conversions from the ZX81 version, although there are a few user-definable graphics in there. I'll try to ignore that for the moment. After landing automatically on Epsilon, it's time to fill up the ship. You enter the number of each unit you want, obviously not knowing where you will go, so I randomly picked a few things I thought might sell. I think the randomness of the game means I think you have a 50% chance of selling something for a profit. Take off is automatic, and for some reason, I'm starting to like the graphics. We head for Psy, and are told some details before we get there. We then land and some aliens arrive, hopefully to buy something. This blob thing feeds off brainwaves, 
So before I can get any further, it starts asking me questions. This is a bit odd. The first question has me reaching for the manual. And a nice reply shows a bit of humour there. Now a maths question. I need a calculator. It's a good job I can pause the game. And a number sequence. Oh, I was never any good at these. So it's a guess. And now for a chemical formula. It's a good job the internet's around. Then we get on to selling things. A random event usually takes place here. Sometimes they steal things off you. Sometimes they ask you to take a mystery cargo somewhere. But once all that's done, the next stop is the moon beta. And here you have to guide your ship to avoid the clouds. And to be honest, I had no idea what was going on. I just pressed some keys randomly and eventually the next event triggered. Entering orbit, you guide your ship to the next moon. And it's time for part two. We get a rundown of beta, and then an automatic landing sequence, and then into the bar to do some trading. When shown your inventory, I copied the screens for reference, making things easier. I imagine a pen and paper would have had to do back then. Now you barter, eventually agreeing on a price. I always tended to start really high and work down in small increments, but that may not be the best strategy. At this point, someone steals some fuel from you. Nice. Another auto takeoff sequence, and it's on to the next event, Alpha. And it seems they want Petrochem. Here you have to interact and guide your ship into the tunnel using up and down. There's no haggling here either, they're all robots, so just decide if you want to sell or not. At this point, you should really remember what you paid for things, although I'd forgotten at this point, oh well. Next event and Gamma, and another interactive sequence. Here you have to take the ship down to the surface and grab the fuel, making sure you get back up within one minute. Sometimes random events happen too. Ah, a ship appears to have appeared next to mine. Oh no, it's the Space Rosers. Luckily all my booster spice was stolen by the wibbly blobbly men early on, so no problems here then. Auto landing on Gamma and a change of style. Usually you get mugged around here somewhere and then have to get back to your ship navigating through the maze. Again with random events thrown in. This use of primitive graphics is actually starting to grow on me, you know. On the way out you could meet strange monsters, dead bodies, get medical supplies, it's all random. Eventually you get to your ship and can take off. You head back to Epsilon and the end of the game. This is where you sell any of your remaining cargo and calculate your credits. And that's your score. And now you can play again, and try and beat it. Which, to be honest, I will. This game has grown on me over the couple of hours I've been playing it. I don't know why. Yes, the graphics are really basic and the plot is very linear. But I think I quite like this. The different styles of gameplay keep you entertained. It makes me want to write a modern version. Now oh, there's an idea. This is Time Machine, released in 1990 by Activision, and written by Raphael Secco. It's a very odd game, but let me explain first. It's an arcade adventure. You control Professor Potts, who is messing about with his time machine, when a terrorist attack sends him back to the prehistoric age and breaks the machine. Your only hope is to manipulate history to try and get back and stop the attack. There are five zones, each with objects that may be needed across all zones. But only the first, the prehistoric, is open to start with. When I first loaded this up, I spent ages wandering about, falling down holes, being hit on the head by fiery boulders, and sinking into the river. Obviously, your professor never learnt to swim. He did, however, learn to control pterodactyls, and he can be picked up and flown around the screens that make up each level. 
back to the game, and reading some hints was the only way I could actually proceed. You have four pods. These can be placed on any screen and used to teleport around. Essential for avoiding swamps and rivers. Although this swamp is a real life taker, which is a pain. Placing one near a cave and the other one near a coconut grove is the first thing to do. You also have a stun gun and the next task is to go to the grove, wait for an animal to appear, stun them, walk up to them until the icon appears at the top left and then teleport to the cave. And here they should just trot off into the cave. You have to do this about twice. The idea is that you're helping early humans to evolve and survive. Next you need to go back to those three boulders where you started and pick them up and drop them into the holes. This is tricky. One wrong move and you fall down and die. Getting the boulders just in the right place takes time and the only way to tell if you've got them right is to wait for them to bob up and down. This though can take several seconds, and in some cases up to ten. These holes are actually geezers, and you are trying to block them. Once all three are blocked, the next level opens up. You can tell this by the level indication top centre of the screen, which turns green for the next level up. At this point, I have very mixed feelings about the game. If you had a lot of time and patience, and have the stamina to try every possible thing on every possible screen, you'll probably enjoy this sort of thing. The graphics are great, but controlling Professor Potts can be problematic. There's no sound either, which is odd, as the reviews mention music and spot effects. I downloaded several versions from several sites, and all of them were silent. I then loaded my original, and still no sound. The next stage involves keeping your little creatures safe, and the first thing you need to do is get them warm. To do this you have to collect wood from this level and fire from Zone 1, and so it goes on. At this point I was crossing a swamp and for some reason was flipped back to Zone 1 and Zone 2 had been disabled and I had no idea why. You collect things, put them in places, collect other things, teleport to them and hopefully, if all goes well, things will progress. This is a good looking game with logical puzzles but they do take a long time to complete. You could of course use a walkthrough but even that is tricky because of the unavoidable deaths and slightly odd controls. If this looks like the challenge you'd enjoy, give it a try. Me though, I'll be putting it back on the shelf. This is Ninja Gaiden Shadow Warriors, released in 2018 by the people listed on screen. The Ninja Gaiden series has seen many versions across many platforms, but this one is a remake of the Game Boy version on the Spectrum. The loading screen is excellent, so on to the game. The screen has been reduced and it's bordered by some well-drawn images, presumably to either maintain the Game Boy ratio or to have less to update and therefore keeping the speed up. Either way, this game is great. The graphics are well drawn and move really well. Your ninja can hit high and low, jump, crouch and do somersaults, as well as climb into the platforms above. There's music that plays throughout, along with sound effects and this really makes the game feel special. I'm not a big fan of beat em ups to be honest, but I do like this one. The difficulty is spot on, allowing you to get far and it keeps dragging you back for more. The screen uses push scrolling, which I'm fine with, because the gameplay is so good. There's an end of level boss too, and overall this is an excellent game. Go and get it now. Anyone around in the early life of the Spectrum will have seen this advert. It certainly stuck in my mind, and now I can try the game out. This is Bonkers, released by Procom Software in 1983. 
The story goes something like this. Earthlings are trapped at the top of a space station, and to escape, you have to guide them one at a time to the airlocks at the bottom. Obviously this is not as simple as it sounds, and there are evil aliens that get in the way. Each Earthling starts at the top of the screen, and walks into start position, which is a nice touch. The screen is split into layers, representing floors and lifts. The lifts move across the screen, and you have to jump into them, and jump out, obviously when it's safe to do so. If you don't get killed, you can guide them into the space at the bottom of the screen. This game is a kind of reverse jumping jack crossed with Frogger, and plays really well. The graphics are simple, but well animated, and the sound is okay too. This is a nice little challenge, fun to play and enjoyable. Yes, it's simple, but it is only just 6k in size. A great little game then, that's worth a try. So, yeah, com okay, computer history. Does it include consoles? Anything, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, if we're including, including consoles, then it's going to have to be a Binaton, isn't it? One of those Binaton TV games that I started with that, that just had 17 versions of Pong on it. Me too. I had exactly the same thing. With an anal mine had an analogue joystick. I think mine had just a, a little um, dial that you turn left or right. Mine had an analogue joystick and only about four or five games on. It had, po <laughs> it, had, it had the usual versions of Pong, Pong and tennis and football, which were just... And hockey. <laughs> in hockey, yeah. Which were just different, kind of slightly different configurations and numbers of bats, weren't they? <laughs> and unfortunately, it, it doesn't work anymore because I took it to Brits to try and find out how it worked. <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> well, I think that, that got about three months worth of play and then um, nothing for a couple of years until um, the ZX81 came out. You had a ZX81? Yeah, yeah. I, I grabbed grab that. And then after that, I got a Spectrum. Mine, mine was the Spectrum. Got... What, your first computer yeah. was a Spectrum? Yeah, it was a Spectrum. Right. I didn't know I was getting it. it. I just got it for Christmas, and it was the best thing I've ever had. After that, well, I had a break from Spectrums, and I got a Commodore 64, and had it for about three months, two months, three months. It was mainly about the music. I was in a software shop looking to buy Spectrum games, yeah. and they had Ghostbusters on the 64 and the music was stunning to me at that having owned a spectrum so i persuaded my parents to buy me a 64 and then i went out and bought as many rob hubbard games as i could find <laughs> so after my spectrum there was nothing it was a big hiatus for me there was nothing right. probably because i went to university and i couldn't afford a, a computer because um, yeah. it was a big step up to things like the amiga and the st um, it was a massive step because of the price there were about 500 the amiga was 499 i think mm. Um, when, the, when the first came out, the Amiga 500s, and I, I badgered and badgered my father to buy me one, and he, he kept saying no, and then eventually we sort of went out and bought one. That was That's the second best machine I've ever owned, the Amiga. It's obviously, the Spectrum's first, but the Amiga is a close second. Yeah. The, and then I got a job in a, in a computer shop selling um, Amigas, so I had access to all the games. Cool. Well, I, I was kind of twofold. The next, the next thing I got that was dedicated to games, really, was a Nintendo 64. So it was a big jump. Oh, that, that was a huge jump from the Spectrum, obviously. But I really got into PC games. I was late. Well, I wasn't late into PC games. I, I went through numerous versions of Amigas. I had the 500, I had a 500 plus, 600, 1500, 2000, and then a 4000. And then the guy that owned the computer shop, I think, said, um, what do you want for a Christmas bonus? Do you want... 100 quid, or do you want uh, an Amstrad 286 PC with a monitor? And I said, I'll have that, I'll, I'll take that computer. And that sort of kick-started 
an, another phase of my life, really. So I'd gone through Spectrums, I'd gone through um, Amigas, and at that point, the Amiga market was was dropping off. Yeah. And the you know the, the the general feel was things were going over to the PC. So I started on the PC with the two eight six, and yeah. then went just, just carried on. Well, I think the first PC I had was a Pentium, so it was a lot later than you. <laughs> yeah, right. And I was playing things like Doom. Um, yeah. Doom was great. We used to in the in the lab that I worked with in when I was doing my um, PhD. We used to play Network Doom. Um, right. <laughs> and, until the network administrator complained that we were flooding <laughs> the network with lots of Doom packets. Um, yes. yeah. Well, you've jumped way ahead of me then because when I, when I I was really lucky because I worked in a computer shop. So if we got anything back or if we got anything that was damaged and I, and it was half working or part working, I, I had free reign to you know bodge it up and get parts from somewhere else. So I, I had two eight six, then I went a three eight six. Then a four eight six, and then various four eight sixes, and then the then the early, early Pentiums. So I just worked my way up slowly as they as things came into the shop and the prices came down. I, I was buying them at retail, so I could get them at retail. So it was it, I was very oh, lucky cool, in that, yeah, in that yeah. respect. But the Nintendo sixty four was interesting because it kind of links back to the Spectrum because of course Rare was a huge big developer for it, and the world. yeah yeah. So I bought it because of Goldeneye. I bought it for because I saw Goldeneye and wanted to play it. Then what after that? I think mean, I think the next thing and probably one of the things that I think is truly retro was uh, Game Boy Advance. I got a Game Boy Advance and that was brilliant, especially the SP. Uh, handheld wise, I I was really wanted to buy Lynx because we had a couple in the shops mm. and they they were really really good machines. But I, I ended up buying a, a Game Gear uh, and again it, that was very short lived. I think you had it for about four months and then I sold it on. And actually it was it was kind of around the Game Boy Advance time that you, you started getting things like the G P two X and the G P thirty two that you could you could actually emulate on a handheld some of the some of the old stuff, Spectrum things. I think that and yeah, I think what did I I had a PlayStation two after that, but we're getting a, we're getting a bit too modern now, aren't we? So Yeah, yeah. I, I had got the original Xbox way, way after its lifetime just so I could put all the emula- emulators on it. Yeah. Got, I've got an Xbox One, so I've got the Ultimate Rare Rare Replay with all the Ultimate games on. So all back full circle, though the Spectrum Next is going to be my next computer. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully it be it will be has been is my next computer. <laughs> yeah, and the same with me. Whatever you said. <laughs> <laughs> I think that ends the section, Paul. That, that ends it. That's the one. <laughs> Retro Revival was back in Walsall again this year, but with a difference. The size had doubled, and that meant double the arcade cabs, double the consoles and computers, and double the traders. And all of this of course meant double the fun. The upper hall that hosted the previous year's event was set up pretty much the same, with a selection of arcade cabs in the centre, tables all around these with consoles of varying types, pinball tables off in a small side room, and traders around the outside. The lower hall was the 80s room, packed with arcade cabs, computers and consoles, as well as a selection of indie titles. This hall also had a fair scattering of traders. Many of the traders throughout both halls tended to focus on consoles, but there were at least four offering PC, Amiga, ST, Commodore and Spectrum titles. In the arcade section I grabbed a few games of Daytona, Popeye and Konami GT in the upper hall, before heading down for some Gyrus, Thunderblade, Chase HQ, Cubert, Donkey Kong and Video Pinball, to name a few. There were a few Spectrum Next machines set up too, housed in original Spectrum cases, playing some of the up and coming titles including Baggers in Space, a kind of cross between Jetpack and Hero, and Warhawk, a shoot 'em up originally on the C64. I picked up several games in a four for a tenner deal, along with a few more donated to the show by Matt Dolphin. The Saturday talks went well, although I missed them all, because I was locked in a room with Jeff, Simon Butler, and later Jim Bagley and Rich Stevenson, for reasons I'll go into later. Day two, Sunday, was less busy, but a market taking up all of the car park was a bit of a pain. 
But arriving early, at least it gave me something to do for a while. More arcade fun was had, and I managed to grab a few games of Tempest 2000 on the Atari Jaguar, and catch up with Octavius Kitten for a quick chat, before dashing off to the talks. The reason I was there on Sunday was down to Jeff and Dean from Retro Asylum, plotting together to get me to help out on the Spectrum next talk. After a pint, they finally persuaded me, and I gave in, which was the reason I was chatting to Simon, Jim and Steve the day before. The talk went very well, avoiding the usual questions and concentrating on the next, the games in progress, hardware changes and visions of the future. Overall, it was an excellent event, and easily my favourite show now. It focuses on retro, and not just the other stuff like cosplay, modern consoles and all that other stuff I have absolutely no interest in. Roll on next year, and massive thanks must go to the Retro Asylum guys for organising the whole thing.